All right, so good morning. Is that way back there? Tommy, you are bad. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. Um, welcome to the 2019 uh, Center for Place, Culture, and Politics Annual Conference. Uh, mobilizations and migrations, or as it says on all of our advertising, migrations and mobilizations. Either way, it works. <laughs> I didn't notice uh, when our astonishingly talented and swift um, designer, Morgan Buck, who's also a PhD candidate here at the Grad Center, did all of her work. I edited every other comma, period, col semicolon, Peter looked, Peter Hitchcock looked at it, everybody looked at it, and I never noticed that the words had been flipped until it was printed. So I love it this way. Um, I am Ruth Wilson Gilmore. If you are my friend, call me Ruthie. Otherwise, call me doctor. And I am delighted to thank all of our many collaborators and co-sponsors. First and foremost, I would like to thank all of the organizers, uh, staff, and faculty who worked on putting the program together. Uh, they include David Harvey, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, Peter Hitchcock, who is the associate director of the center and actually was the acting director for the last three semesters, so it's, he's probably itching at the bit, chafing at the bit now that I'm back. Um, uh, Mary Taylor, who is our assistant director and coordinates all of the thankless tasks necessary to make anything work. And Sonia vash Burgis, who has been the postdoc in the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics for the past three years, as well as a postdoc we nabbed from the Institute on Research, uh, for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean, Mamir Prosper. Uh, all of us in, uh, in collaboration with Ezra Padgett and uh, Sam Starkweather in the Center for Humanities and many other people have made this uh, event possible. Today, uh, we will have uh, three events uh, after David Harvey offers some words of welcoming wisdom or not. Uh, we will have a panel, break for lunch, the conference participants will have lunch together. The rest of you are on your own. Uh, then we will reconvene. So the first panel is called Migrations. The, uh, we will reconvene at 2.30 for the second panel, um, Mediations. And then after a coffee break, uh, we will have our opening keynote, a discussion between Sonia Borgish and Sana Naada, uh, after we screen uh, one of Sana's amazing films, The Return of Cabral, U Regreso de Cabral. Tomorrow, we will convene at the People's Forum, which is on 37th Street between 9th and 10th Avenue, addresses in your program, where we will have a panel on mobilizations and a lunch break, everyone will be fed, everyone, bring your friends, and then a closing keynote, Vijay Prashad, uh, chaired by Mamira, Prosper. I uh, couldn't be more pleased to have this combination of thinkers together to talk with each other. As you will see, um, if you're not on the program, we're going to try uh, an interlocutory experiment so that instead of sitting uh, quaking, waiting for one's turn to speak, we listen really hard to each other and get the conversation going at the beginning. So without further ado, I'd like to invite David Harvey up for a few words. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome very much to this uh, uh, event. Uh, the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics was uh, founded in 1999, so this is our 20th anniversary. Um, over these 20 years, of course, uh, a lot of things have changed, but I would even push it back uh, further because I think over the last uh, 40 years, uh, we've seen uh, a, a revival of longstanding patterns of uh, human migration, which have been, I think, uh, uh, on the one hand troubling, but on the other hand, uh, opening up 
uh, new possibilities. And a lot of this uh, period has, of course, been marked by astonishing violence. I can't get out of my head that this is the 25th anniversary of the Rwanda genocide. And if you uh, think about things going on in the world right now and think about Yemen, think about uh, uh, the Congo, uh, you think about uh, Syria, you think about what's going on in Venezuela where it seems that uh, the American economic policy of squeezing the economy until everybody screeches uh, is uh, well underway, creating a huge kind of migrant uh, stream uh, uh, around in Latin America as well. So with these migrant streams, it seemed to me, and I'm very glad this conference has converged on this, is to see these migrant streams not as problems, but as opportunities, uh, opportunities to create alternatives. And what I think is uh, quite astonishing when you think about uh, the violence that has occurred in many parts of the world is how people have frequently turned this around into something that's really radically different uh, in the search for some kind of more uh, human uh, manner of uh, living together, of bringing together and, and using the vitality that comes from all the diverse experience of humanity and to do it in a way that is, I think, uh, uh, progressive in the sense that it actually starts to define alternative modes of living, alternative ways of relating, uh, and actually alternative ways of uh, building economic strength and, and economic life. Now, I'm not going to talk for, uh, for much further because I think that uh, I really want to listen very much to the many participants who have come. Uh, there are many sponsoring organizations of this, which I think uh, we should acknowledge and, and thank. Uh, but at the same time, I think most of all, I want to thank the participants uh, to bring your wisdom and, and all that you have to say into a conversation. And this conversation, I think, uh, is something which uh, is invaluable uh, in these particularly precarious times. So with that, let me just turn it over to the first session because I think that I want to hear the conversation rather than uh, sort of get on talking about all, everything that I've thought about the last three months, which is actually not very much, I have to tell you. <laughs> Okay, so thanks you very much and welcome and let's have a great time. Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a very special moment, again, to be uh, part of the CPCP annual conference uh, with all of you. Um, and uh, so, again, I think it's an opportunity for us to share uh, discussions and uh, uh, how we can uh, move forward um, in uh, our thinking and also our actions uh, around uh, pressing issues uh, such as uh, the ones we're going to discuss today and tomorrow. So um, before I introduce the, the speakers, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, how uh, uh, the, the proposal for how um, we are going to uh, to have the, the sessions. So the idea is that uh, each presenter will speak between 10 and 12 minutes, and then after uh, each one presents, the second presenter would ask one or two questions, and uh, so it will be a follow-up question and an answer for about five more minutes, and then we are gonna go around with uh, this conversation uh, and then uh, after that, we're going to open up uh, for questions and comments. So um, I'm, uh, you can choose the order I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the three speakers. Um, Javiela Evangelista is an assistant professor with the, American, with the African American Studies Department at New York City 
College of Technology, CUNY, where she developed the new interdisciplinary course, The Heritage of Imperialism. Her research focuses on race, nation, and human rights in the Caribbean and the African diaspora. Uh, she is working on her book, book project on citizenship as a human rights, supported by a faculty fellowship with the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the CUNY Graduate Center, and by PSC CUNY Awards for archival research. Thank you. Uh, Naomi Paik is an assistant professor of Asian American Studies at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Her book, Rightlessness, Testimony of uh, Redness in U.S. Prison Camps Since World War II, uh, has received several awards and it reads testimonial narratives of subjects rendered rightness by the U.S. states their imprisonment and camps. She has published articles in Social Text, Radical History Review, Cultural Dynamics, Race and Class, Hemispherica, Humanity, and the collection Guantanamo and the American Empire. She's currently writing Walls, Bands, Raids, Sanctuary under contract with University of California Press, a short book on the criminalization of migrants in the US and the radical sanctuary movements. As a board member of the Radical History Review, she's co-editing three special issues of the journal on militarism and capitalism, radical histories of sanctuary, and the policing justice and radical imagination. She's also developing a new project on military outsourcing. Her research and teaching interests include comparative ethnic studies, U.S. imperialism, U.S. militarism, social and cultural approaches to legal studies, transnational and women of color feminisms, uh, carceral spaces, and labor, race, and migration. Thanks. And uh, Sharon Kozravi is a professor of social anthropology at <coughs> Stockholm University and the author of the books Young and Defian in Tehran, uh, The Illegal Traveler, An Auto Ethnography of Borders, Precarious Lives, Waiting and Hope in Iran, uh, and After Deportation, Ethnographical ethnographic perspectives. Uh, he has been also ac an active writer in the Swedish press and has also written fiction. So thank you all. Um, do you have a special order uh, to go? Would you like to start? Oh, okay, so for the PowerPoint, uh, do you need me to help you with that? Okay. Hi everyone, how are you? Great, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about the conversation today. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, statelessness in Dominican Republic and just wanted to start by saying that this is a very personal project for me. My mother is Dominican, my father is from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so it's been a lifelong research project really. Um, when I was an undergrad in 1999, I went to the Dominican Republic as a Mellon Fellow. I worked with a group called Casa por la, por la Identidad de la Mujer Afro, and really um, the research took off from there. Um, 2013, when there was a constitutional uh, change that revoked the citizenship of over 200,000 uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent, my research took a turn um, to try to understand what had happened there. So I started working with a group called Reconocido, which means to be recognized in Dominican Republic. 
Um, <clears throat> and so I'd also like to say um, in opening that I consider myself an anthropologist for the public, with the public, um, so that my project from conceptualization through design, um, implementation has been in solidarity with this particular group, um, Reconocido. Um, and Ana Maria, who um, is a primary member of the group, will be here this week, and so I'll share at the end of the talk um, some spaces where you may be able to talk uh, with her and engage with Reconocido. Um, so statelessness um, in the Dominican Republic uh, became official under this constitutional law, 168.13, um, in 2013. Essentially, um, 200,000 Dominicans of Haitian descent uh, had their citizenship revoked. So you can see um, in this chart, this is from 2014, that this is the largest uh, case of mass statelessness in the Western Hemisphere um, and the fifth largest in the world. Since then, the charts have changed somewhat. Um, in 2015, it was noted that the number was 130,000. And in 2016 and 2017, Dominican Republic has been completely removed um, from the UNHCR's uh, documentation. I'd argue that that's part of the erasure um, that the Dominican government has put into place, which I'll uh, talk a bit about um, today. So when this uh, law took place, uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent were divided into two groups, Group A and Group B. Group A was largely for those who had already had some form of documentation. Group B was for those who didn't have their formal documentation uh, for a wide range of reasons, um, many of which were connected to uh, disenfranchisement by the Dominican government. Um, and so Group B was put into a group of foreigners and they then had to re-register um, for their citizenship uh, through a process of naturalization. And um, it, it was pretty clear to those who had been denationalized that this was a case of anti-blackness. So for many Dominicans of Haitian descent, when they uh, went to register, for example, and I was there in 2014, went to the junta uh, with several uh, uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent who attempted to re-register um, and there were cases uh, where people were put towards the front of the line um, if they were of a lighter hue or um, from Central America. Um, and so clearly a case of, of anti-blackness that is not new in the Dominican Republic. So the legalization is new, the constitutional change, um, but for many years there's been this dispossession. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it in great detail, but um, from the denial of birth certificates for Dominicans of Haitian descent born in hospitals, there are significant studies, many by a group called Omica. Um, there is a famous case of two young uh, schoolgirls, Yen and Bosico, um, that went all the way to the Inter-American uh, Commission of Human Rights in 1997. Um, when they weren't able to continue to go to school, they were being denied the right to go to school just based on um, their association with Haiti and the, the fact that their parents were Haitian. And this is well documented in the Inter-American Inter Commission for Human Rights. So part of what I wanna share with you today is that the legalization of statelessness is new, but obviously you know, the discrimination against Haitian migrants and Dominicans of Haitian descent is not new. In part, many of us don't know about this because of the conflation by the Dominican government um, just, I'm curious, out of a show of hands, I mean, many of us in this room um, do work that's related, so we may be more aware than uh, many other folks out there, but I'm curious if uh, anyone in the room had heard about the denationalization, the revocation of citizenship for Dominicans of Haitian descent in Dominican Republic. Okay, good, maybe half of us in the room, so that's good. Um, but uh, generally, uh, Many people aren't aware, and I'd argue that it's related to the conflation of the issue um, by the Dominican government. So in 2015, um, the year 
uh, two years after uh, 168.13, but one year after 164.69.14, um, which was the path to naturalization, there, were, there was an increase in deportations in Dominican Republic. So let me say that again. So after the uh, law that revoked citizenship, 168.13, took place in 2013, the following year, in part because of pressure from the international community, uh, locally, groups like Reconocido um, petitioning, the Dominican government came up with an answer, which was 169.14, a path to naturalization. Complete uh, chaos. The centers were not always where they said they would be. Um, it was very hard for people to get to the centers. It was very expensive. Um, and again, uh, the groups had been separated, group A and group B, so there wasn't a lot of clarity about really who belonged in which group. Furthermore, the deadline uh, for Haitian migrants to register uh, with the Dominican state was the same deadline as the deadline for those in Group B who had been put in the Book of Foreigners to register with the state. Um, it was June 15th of 2015. And so there were many questions about where people were supposed to go um, and you know the difference between the rights of migrants and citizens because the Dominican government really didn't talk about the citizenship issue. And so when I did a quick review of um, media coverage in 2015, from Al Jazeera to CNN to Huffington Post Live, the uh, headlines were pretty much the same. Dominican Republic set to deport Haitian migrants. And many of you probably remember this moment. It, you know, was, there was a lot of coverage around this issue. And so Dominican citizens were erased from the conversation. And I think that was a goal um, of the Dominican government at the time. And so part of what I want to convey is you know, the danger of this uh, conflation, um, but also the connections between um, citizenship uh, and migration and citizens and migrants. So, you know, Dominican Americans here in the United States um, who have dual citizenship can vote in Dominican elections. For those of us in New York and Washington Heights, you may see the election trucks uh, come around and campaign. And so, you know, one of the conversations we're trying to have is about the connections between citizenship and migration and how Dominican Americans, if aware of the issue and express um, significant concern can help make an intervention. If Dominicans acknowledge themselves as migrants as well, then that can help make an intervention in the conversation. So my central goal here today is to highlight um, the issue of the revocation of citizenship and the legal rights that Dominican um, citizens of Haitian descent should have, but also to make clear that there are commonalities that need to be highlighted between uh, citizens and migrants. Um, and to move towards closing, I believe, I haven't checked time, but uh, to move towards closing, um, there are significant connections for us to consider here in the United States. Uh, Haitian migrants came to the, to the Dominican Republic um, largely during the occupation uh, by the U.S. 1916 to 1924, where uh, the U.S. government bought a lot of uh, Jim Crow uh, perspectives and policies and argued that Haitian uh, migrant labor was black labor. Um, and that's why it belonged on the sugar plantations as opposed to Dominicans. Um, and so some of those divides are very much connected to um, US imperialism and many other connections, Italian corporations and things of that nature. Um, but racial capital is certainly um, central to the ways in which Dominican, uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent have been dispossessed. And so the fact that they were bought to the Dominican Republic, their parents bought to the Dominican Republic to produce this labor and are now being dispossessed um, seems like for a range of reasons, a uh, decline in the value of the uh, sugar industry, um, thinking about the uh, earthquake that took place in 2010, along with increased migration from Haiti, we saw an increase in kind of right wing rhetoric in Dominican Republic. Um, so there are many things to consider, but um, I hope that um, 
have left us with something to think about in terms of the connections between migration and citizenship and what's at stake for all of us. This is a democratic state just 2,000 miles away. Um, and we see you know, increases in uh, denaturalization cases here in the United States, um, kind of accusations of fraud justifying the revocation of citizenship. So I just wanted to start us off with uh, thinking about the DR, but also thinking about us here. Thank you. Thank you. And before I ask uh, Naomi a few questions, I forgot to, I skipped over, there's not enough time to cover. I just wanted to share with you um, this uh, flyer. If anyone is free Tuesday evening, um, at the new school there'll be a conversation with Ana Maria Belique, who is um, one of the, uh, wouldn't say uh, leaders, but primary activists with uh, Reconocido um, in conversation with Ana Paula. Um, and they'll be screening Hasta la Ra Raiz, which is a film about statelessness in the DR um, and kind of their, their struggles there. So I wish she could have been here with me today, but hopefully you can engage with her there. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Oh, uh, sorry. Actually, uh, I think we, I thought you were going before me, so I had that in mind. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we had a, a, a change in the order, so uh, Sharon is going to ask the first questions. Okay. Should I? They ask me to I'll go sit down. Okay. Okay. Hey, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is it on? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, your presentation. Um, I, w I was thinking about statelessness, not only in form of lacking papers, but lacking uh, having access to state protection, um, not being excluded from the spheres of rights. And I was thinking about the from United States. You mentioned, um, because it's, it's one of the main, you know, destination of deportation from the United States to the mm -hmm. Dominican Republic. Right. And you mentioned U United States occupation of Haiti. And I, I, I was thinking also the role of deportation to Dominican Republic and production of labor, as you mentioned, because there is a link between deportation and hiring of deportees yeah. as cheaper labor force for all American companies outsourcing to the Dominican Republic. Um, so so how, how do you see any relationship between deportation from here, statelessness there, and this kind of production of labor? Thank you for the question. Um, I certainly do, um, and there's a personal connection here for deportees in my family. Um, in particular, uh, my cousin's husband, uh, Henry, uh, was deported from the United States in the early 2000s and was immediately hired um, upon his arrival in Dominican Republic by Sirius Radio, where he works at a call center um, and was seen as, desire as a desirable laborer because his English is fluent um, and when he first got there, his Spanish wasn't uh, that fluent, but within months, you know, he was able to work both lines for the, the corporation. And so certainly, and he's been in a really vulnerable position um, because of his uh, record. He, he stayed with the company, essentially, because he hasn't felt like he's had a lot of room for mobility. And there's conversation about, um, you know, how he, he's able to hold a position that not everyone there can have. So it seems like his fluency in English, the, it's, it's positioned as a strength or something that he um, offers that others can't, but he's um, working for below minimum wage. And so, you know, his pay at Sirius uh, Radio, I can't remember the exact number, but it was under $10 an hour. Um, and so certainly the, exploitative nature 
of, of his situation is, is clear to me. Hmm. So I, I, his, my example of Henry, I think, yeah. characterizes what you're describing. Yeah. That is interesting because this kind of statelessness is not a simple act of exclusion, but you know, inclusion at, inclusion right. at the same time. You're That's excluded right. from the territory of this country, but at the same time, you are included That's right. in the economy of this. Yeah. Right, centrally, yes, yes. Um, particularly in the free trade zones as well. Um, I was mentioning to Naomi earlier, um, I may end up asking her a, a question as well, I'm not sure how, which way we're gonna go, um, but just thinking about, um, you know, the. I've talked to people before about if the law changes overnight, what will happen? So we advocate for the, re, uh, the reinstitution of rights, um, but the negation of rights goes so far beyond the, the law. And uh, something that we've talked about often um, uh, with Reconocido is the ways in which society has been emboldened, uh, Dominican civil society has been emboldened after the constitutional change. Um, so that, you know, there have been, 2015, there was a lynching um, of a young man, Henry uh, Jean-Claude Dulile, in a public square. Um, and the government argued that it wasn't racially motivated. And since when are lynchings not racially motivated? And so just thinking about so many, so many questions, but um, in terms of the paradigm that you've set up, I'm also questioning what happens if the law uh, does work on your side, what are the other challenges that continue to, to exist um, with work, with you know, the exploitation of labor, with civil society um, promoting uh, racist ideals and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to clarify, once uh, we continue with the discussion, it's going to be more fluid and uh, you can ask questions to each other uh, as you would like. Uh, so there will be other opportunities as well to, to continue with the, with the questions. So, uh, Shahan, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie, for uh, inviting me. Thank you, the organizer, for this very interesting event. I started doing migration studies 20 years ago and uh, started um, doing research on diaspora. And in that context, diaspora was um, a form, a project of successes, achievements, having a second home, being cosmopolitan, being part of transnational networks. And now, 20 years later, I find myself doing more and more writing, research, field work among people who are expelled. Um, um, kind of expulsion, not only from territories and countries, but, but a broader expulsion. Groups are expelled from uh, uh, communities, labor markets, housing market, healthcare system, state protection. To use uh, Peter Nayers, who coined the Portspra, the combination of diaspora and deportation, to understand, you know, this kind of uh, large uh, uh, social abandonment. Um, this kind of expulsion happens not through techniques of bordering uh, that operates through immobilizing and confinement, but through keeping people continuously on the move. As Foucault wrote, uh, you know, the circulation and ensuring that things are always in movement is an efficient regime of management of population and place. People are sent back and forth between countries, between reception camps and removal camps, between asylum seekings and deportability, between countries, between legislation, between institutions, between periods of waitings. Um, a common experience of this condition of being kept in circulation is, uh, is a sense of being sent back in time, expressed by people I talk to, um, um, they put it in this way, it's being sent back to a square one. 
continual sending of people to a square one is a tactic to produce a surplus population who are denied a chance to valorize their labor, constantly keep in circulation what is one is turned into merely labor power with restricted or no possibility to participate politically or socially. This is a way to keep migrants workers and not recognize them as people. Even we scholars keep calling them migrants and not people. Um, and Europe today works hard to keep this separation. As maybe you know, Swiss writer Mark Frisch said in early 1970s in, in relation the context of labor guest worker context, he, he, he said, we wanted workers, but we got people instead. So this is why Europe tries to keep people and uh, workers separated, migrants separated. When migrants are not people, they can easier be sent back to a square one. Being sent back to a square one leads to accumulation of wealth through the stealing of time. And you know, capital grows through stealing of time. When people are especially removed, they are automatically robbed of a, an amount of time. The time people have spent to accumulate social and cultural and economic capital is taken away from them again and again. What about taxes and social security contribution people have maybe have paid before being removed? What about unused holidays? How many working hours are stolen? How much money did the employer save in form of unpaid wages? How much money does the state save in form of unpaid pensions? How much surplus value have been produced for capitalists through deportation uh, and removal globally? And as Marx showed, uh, surplus value is generated from time the capitalists don't pay for, um, uh, the time which is stolen from them. So like people who have been trafficked, deportees' time is actively stolen. Um, using the term stealing emphasizes how bordering practices that keep people being sent back to school one is part of the accumulation of wealth in the hands of few. So to be the port break is a mood of being in the world characterized by multiple and settling prolonged waiting, a sense of always arriving too late in Fanonian terms. Nonetheless, the port break practices and claims in form of remigration, mobilization of transnational networks, solidarity, protests, and disturbing the national order of things reveals the port spra to be also a space of resistance and defiance. During so-called refugee crisis, 2015-2016, many uh, countries, uh, states in Europe, closed uh, train stations um, um, and stopped people without papers to take trains to other countries. And when police tried to remove them from stations, people protested and started chanting, open borders and freedom, freedom. Sometimes, many times in their own languages, in fita, Arabic word for openness, and azadi, Persian word for freedom. These are same slogans people have been chanting in decades in the Middle East. By chanting freedom and openness, they link the struggle for in fita, in the Arabic word, in Arab world and the struggle for Azadi freedom for, from Iran and Afghanistan to the struggle to openness, the struggle for openness and freedom in Europe. By chanting freedom and openness, they disclose how the oppressive fences in Europe are related to the oppressive fences in Kabul, Damascus, Istanbul, Tehran, and Palestine. The word movement means both the act of moving, changing place, but also organized activity that challenge existing structure and aims towards social change. The border transgressors movement in both of meaning of the word produce a subjectivity through the action of politics challenging the border regime and national border of, uh, order of things. By putting their body, they in, still today happens in Greece, they sit on the tracks of railways, yeah? 
and sitting on the tracks, they turned their body into blockage. The refugee um, a hinder, they, they turned the body to hinder a regime of mobility that does not include them. In Sarah Ahmed's uh, term, uh, they are willful subjects. An interesting feature of refugees' movement is that they disturb the, distinct, the distinction between private and, uh, uh, private and public. When not walking, they occupy train station. They shared food, shoes, information with each other. They turn train station into bedroom, train platform into living room, abandoned carriages into kitchens, and walls into notebooks for messages, slogans, signs, and traces. Tony Judds, in two essays in the New York Review of Books 2010, showed the significance of railways and railway station for the emergence of the modern life and for a railway, and, and that railways and railway stations were a collective project and played a crucial role in making living collectively possible and therefore in the emergence of civil society and the urban life. He rightly states that railways and railway stations as public space and civil societies are linked to each other. And refugees and migrants, by marching along rails through the Balkan route, and occupying train stations um, brought back these to life, brought back the political and collective project of public spaces that has for a long time been depoliticized. De they had been depoliticized because according to Jad, gated individuals did not know how to share this particular public space for common cause. The refugee welcome social movements uh, in Europe, throughout the Europe, in the main train stations um, during 2015 and 2016, brought the idea of a collective political life and a shared public space back to the train stations, which otherwise have been depoliticized and dehistoricized, reduced to being viewed as a passage, a corridor, and a place for consumption. So refugees, not as a crisis, but um, as actors who remind us what was the project of modernity in, in big cities and uh, railways, railway stations. Um, and we should re recognize that. So knowing that, the question is, what do we owe them? Thank you. So Javier would ask a few questions. Okay. 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 So I'm just kind of pulling my thoughts together about your um, about your wonderful work. Um, so I guess I have uh, two different kinds of questions. So one is kind of. Uh, speaks more back to the earlier part of your talk today and thinking about um, that expulsion happens not through bordering and immobilization, but in keeping people continuously on the move. Um, but also thinking about how, um, I, I'm interested in how uh, that your more recent interest in people who are expelled from territories and countries and, not, and also from what you termed as state protection and uh, healthcare systems and things like this. And I'm wondering if I could kind of push, push you on that a little bit, because it seems like to me um, that the state has never been there to protect the people that you're talking about, like Afghan migrants to Europe or um, Iranian migrants to Europe. And so um, some of the other parts of your talk, we're talking about how that has ex exactly been the case, that the state has never really been there from them. It's really only been there to regulate them but not there as a source of protection or rights recognition or anything like that. But it's really certainly just about keeping them as workers and not as people, right? So keeping them in certain kinds of labor markets, facilitating the theft of their time and therefore facilitating the accumulation of capital for both for markets and then also for the state in terms of unpaid um, social, social security and things like that. So I'm wondering if I could push you a little bit on yeah. that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Um, I have been working in two 
different, I, I taught two different fields in, um, in the past 20 years. One, uh, I was interested to, to understand the, the situation of marginalized people in Iran, the country I come from, and m migrants in Europe, yeah? And I thought this is two different fields, mm -hmm. yeah? But during writing my recent book, Precarious Life, Waiting and Hope in Iran, I realized more and more it's same thing. Mm. So, you know, the situation, citizens, marginalized, poor mm -hmm. people in Iran mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to situation non-citizens face in Europe. Mm -hmm. So this is also, I, I didn't maybe um, um, explain or, or develop that in this short input, but, but um, w what we face, I, I mean, you are right, you know, states are not there to protect Afghan asylum seekers or undocumented Iranians, but this is the condition we see which face not only non-citizens and documented migrants, but also marginalized mm -hmm. uh, citizens, racialized citizens, poor people. Mm -hmm. um, and in case of Afghans you mentioned, this is very interesting, they face this kind of precariousness, mm -hmm. not only in Europe, mm -hmm. but also in the country of their citizenship, you know, Afghanistan mm -hmm. as ethnic minorities, as a religious minorities. So, so this is what you see is a global, this is transnational code of, of expulsion, no matter where they are, you know, no matter which state they face, yeah? Mm -hmm. They are expelled from spheres of rights, mm -hmm. you know, everywhere, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah, so this is what I try to understand. Mm -hmm. you know? This is not about citizenship anymore. This is not about this country or asylum process. Mm -hmm. This is about a brutal abandonment. This uh -huh. is a brutal expulsion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. of people. Thank you so much. I think that actually um, coincides really nicely with ha ha Havelina's uh, work as well, in terms of thinking about um, the kind of citizen and non-citizen, or between state pr record stateless, right? And that this isn't just, um, we can't uh, uh, have the nation state as the container of the thinking of through these questions. So my second question um, was really about kind of the resistance to um, this kind of continuous, like expulsion through the continuous movement. And so I was really um, compelled by that image of people putting their bodies literally on train tracks to stop that circulation. And so I'm wondering, and I was also very compelled by um, the way that you talked about the chance of freedom and open borders, that those were chanted for decades in the Middle East before they then became, um, started being uh, articulated on European trains. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, since the nation state cannot be the container of thinking about these issues of rightlessness, statelessness, um, if you can think, if you could help us think through um, maybe the mobility of these uh, new forms of um, articulations of belongingness or inclusivity or um, resistance to these kinds of state regimes. I don't know is, is, if this is a struggle for belongingness or belonging. I, I heard many people said, you know, fuck refugeeness, fuck asylum. This is a struggle for survival, you know, not to belong, yeah? This is not for belonging. Um, this is for uh, being alive. Um, struggle to participate. Yeah, not to belong. Struggle to be able to to vote, to to have a work, to to uh, to send their kids to to schools. Um, so n not belonging. Um, I'm sorry, I keep saying it because I'm a little bit allergic to belonging. The term belonging. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Yes, and I think this is also the same struggle they have been doing in their own countries, in Syria, in Iran, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. You know, struggle to participate, yeah? We are citizens of this country. We have right to, to have work. We have right to, to vote. We, our children have right to, uh, to go to school. 
even if we are ethnic minorities, even if we are political, you know, uh, uh, activists, uh, uh, etc. Um, so this is this is why I, I think we should link these two different, not different, to to, to say this is same struggle here and there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Naomi? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Okay, um, first of all, I wanted to thank all the organizers, including Ruthie Gilmore and uh, Candace Chu, who's not here, and then uh, for bringing us together, and also to Mary Taylor for coordinating all the details and making it very smooth and seamless for us to be here. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this conversation, um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversations as they develop over the next two days. Okay, so today I'm gonna draw on my current work, which um, examines the roots of contemporary quote-unquote crises, and every time I use that word, I'm putting uh, scare quotes around it, over immigration in the U.S., as well as radical sanctuary movements that challenge these so-called crises. Um, I know it may seem a bit odd to focus on sanctuary, which is usually, we think of as enacted in local spaces in a conference speaking towards internationalism. But I want to ask how sanctuary and internationalism challenge state sovereignty, um, particularly of uh, settler colonial states and their commitments to bans, walls, and raids, if from different directions. So one internal to the space of the nation, one external. Um, and during the dis discussion, I'd like to think more about the question of how sanctuary uh, movements might share strategies among their sited locations across national borders. And to that point, um, migrant justice, by definition, cannot be contained by any single nation state. Um, more important, the structural, um, you know, because people are moving across borders, but more important, the structural conditions leading to rising right-wing regimes globally um, emerge from the growing contradiction of a post-Westphalian world organized into nation states in an increasingly globalized economy and society. So put differently, the globalization of capital and the displacements they induce pull against the lockdown of borders and the increased policing of both citizens and non-citizens within those borders. Um, indeed, so if we think of here, Trump's attacks are not isolated uh, to racialized non-citizens, and the undercurrents that gave rise to him are not isolated to the United States alone. So right-wing populist movements draw on the common strategy of scapegoating and targeting outcasts, whether non-citizens, racial ethnic or religious minorities, or queer, poor, disabled, or indigenous people. Um, and so these right-wing movements are actually making the connections for us. Um, they already have the intersectional, intersectional analysis, if from the dark side. Um, and these structural uh, roots mean that the struggles of sub subjugated peoples are shared across borders, as um, we were just talking about. Um, and so the escalation of these forces into right-wing movements supported by state governments is fortifying the violence that's tying our fates together. And so I think um, the U.S. sanctuary movement might give us some kinds of examples um, that um, even though they focused on non-citizens under duress, they are currently uh, grappling with the collusions of, state, uh, of the state and capital that target ever more people and places. So they are be they're having to become more radical in their analysis and their strategies. And so conceptually, I look to sanctuary not as offering so much a roadmap to combating all these forces that we're up against, but as a capacious concept, um, a deep genealogy, and a recurrent social movement that might inform what we can do. Um, and so thinking about its gene genealogy, its genealogy stretches back millennia, and so that's very deep roots to draw from. Um, numerous religious traditions include some variation of sanctuary in their um, histories. Um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam root their stories in sanctuary, in the stories of Exodus, Christmas, and the Hegira. Um, the, con the concept is also found in the, in the demand that we treat the stranger with hospitality as if they were our neighbor. Indeed, in the New Testament, the words stranger and neighbor are in fact synonymous. And in medieval Europe, churches granted sanctuary to fugitives from blood feuds and government and harsh government punishments, granting mercy granted by uh, 
divine powers that prevail over any civil authority. It was seen as the human enactment of God's mercy. Um, however, as secular legal systems of the modern nation state developed, incorporating due process protections for the accused, the state eroded the apparent uh, need for sanctuary and the power of the church over the state. Um, foundational liberal philosophers of the Enlightenment, like John Locke, viewed sanctuary as fundamentally unfair, enabling wrongdoers to evade justice. Um, and because it endows the state with the authority to determine justice without alternative or exception, political liberalism is antithetical to notions of sanctuary. Um, sanctuary's eradication, in fact, became a signifier of modern progress. Um, and furthermore, the existence of sanctuary spaces threatened the rising sovereign state. This is around the 16th century. Um, so sanctuary provided an alternative and ultimate source of authority rooted in the divine. It thereby challenged the sovereignty essential to the very definition of a nation state. Sanctuary confirmed that the state does not have exclusive control over what happens within its territory, which uh, is a point that I'll return to in just a minute. Um, but though formally eliminated, sanctuary practices keep re-emerging because the equality of all persons before the law never came to pass. Liberal political philosophy claims ideals of universal equality while in fact basing its lofty principles on particular notions of who gets to be an equal subject. These ideals of liberalism never considered including in the community of equals, those subjected to extermination, slavery, labor exploitation, patriarchal subordination, and so on. As Elizabeth Brunig argues, we did not trade mercy for justice. We find ourselves both unjust and merciless. And so the history of the United States shines glaring light on the inherent failure of uh, liberal principles to to secure justice for all. One of my arguments is that US political liberalism is in fact at the root of the problems that we're um, confronting today. And so sanctuary practices return again and again in our history, um, in the Underground Railroad and resistance to the Fugitive Slave Acts, more and more recently in sanctuary movements for Central American refugees fleeing the dirty wars of the 1980s, or currently in sanctuary cities for undocumented persons. And I've written about how, um, very critically, about many of these existing sanctuary policies welcoming um, good uh, law-abiding immigrants while further casting out bad law-breaking persons. Um, and these iterations of sanctuary, these liberal forms of sanctuary, operate within the limits of liberalism, even though liberalism is fundamentally antagonistic to the idea of sanctuary, right? So they operate within this fundamental paradox that they can't get themselves out of. Um, and yet I still argue for some value in the concept of sanctuary, um, but I argue that we also have to kind of let go of these current liberal attachments, right? Um, so beyond its grounded interventions of non-cooperation and providing safe harbor, sanctuary already performs conceptual work that can undermine the criminalization of targeted peoples. So contesting federal policies, subnational sanctuary jurisdictions translate abstract human rights into concrete policies backed up by their institutional forms. Meanwhile, supranational formations like human rights regimes and inter international solidarity movements provide subjugated peoples alternative venues to demand justice beyond the realm of the nation state. Um, right. So we can see such claims to um, supranational formations in the We Charge Genocide campaigns that went to the United Nations in 1951 and in 2014. To, um, and these ones in 2014 uh, protested the hyper-policing of criminalized Chicago youth. Um, however, the fact that human rights institutions fail to rein in the violations committed by sovereign states like the United States um, points to the limits of seeking recognition from institutional powers, right? So on the one hand, um, I understand that we need to go to institutional powers, but at the same time, that will always be a limited strategy. So many of the organizers, the same people who um, organized the We Charge Genocide campaign of 2014, have shifted into movements currently um, to, uh, in, in movements for example, to erase the gang database and to stop a cop academy from being built in the same neighborhoods where Rahm Emanuel closed 50 schools and mental health uh, centers. Um, and these campaigns crucially uh, unite immigrant justice with abolitionist movements that seek to tear down forms of state violence and capitalist dispossession while demanding investment in institutions of community building like those very same schools and health centers that were closed down. Um, 
And these organizers are guided by uh, radical analyses that grasp things by the root, making, both making demands on state institutions, but also looking beyond them and creating their own things, um, and indeed directly challenging the very legitimacy of the uh, nation state. Um, so to cite, oh, so this is, I move that. Okay, so to cite um, one example that I think of, um, is, uh, is this one. Um, so members of the Tongva Nation and other Native people hosted a welcoming ceremony at LAX airport um, during the protests um, against the Muslim ban. Um, and asserting their claims to, the U to US lands as its original peoples, uh, these Native activists challenged the state's sovereignty. As Nick Estes, who's in this photo, um, of the Lower Brule Sioux tribe noted, Welcome, welcoming Muslim migrants not only recognized their humanity in distinction to the United States, it also contested the US settler state full stop, which does not have um, full say on who or what comes into the country or exclusive ownership over who and what counts as human. So the United States, like all sovereign states, imagines that it maintains sole authority over its entire territory and everyone in it. This uh, sovereign power seems so entrenched as to be unremarkable. But this belief that US power aligns seamlessly with its territory has never been true. As the genealogy of sanctuary shows, there have always been spaces internal to the nation that elude the state's control. In religious spaces where the sovereign state cannot intrude, or in sanctuary jurisdictions that contest the power of the federal government to dictate how they engage with their own residents. Um, and the settler colonial foundations of the United States further expose the fiction that the, that the US is the sole sovereign. The land that we consider the United States holds many nations. And this multiplicity of sovereigns can expand the way we think about our relationships to this place and to the people in it, one that is not confined to notions of US citizenship. Um, so this welcoming ceremony worked, in Estes's words, to reclaim our sovereignty, our citizenship, and most importantly, our kinship. It articulated different ways of asserting claims to the community created by members of that community, particularly those dehumanized by the US state, um, cast as illegal, terrorist, criminal, or expendable. Indeed, multiple indigenous nations offer alternative models of relationality that may uh, help us reimagine solutions, as historian Elizabeth Ellis of the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma argues. These models conceive of, I will not use the word belonging, maybe affinity, affiliation, <laughs> relationality, <laughs> um, through reciprocal obligations among humans and resources, right? So reconceiving, reconceiving of affinity through reciprocal obligations among humans and resources, and one that sees consensual incorporation as a way to expand our power as a people rather than as a threat. So an abolitionist sanctuary too acknowledges that mere presence secures uh, membership in our social and political community. From this approach, sanctuary is not an act of charity, which is kind of the model that many churches may, may draw on, but of establishing reciprocal relationships with each other, with the original people of this place, and, on the, land, and the land on which we all live. And I think that sanctuary's uh, etymology as also not being a, just about um, sanctuary for persons, but also for natural spaces and for other species can maybe help us think through our, our, these reciprocal obligations to each other. Right? So th this approach to sanctuary has the potential to reconceive of membership beyond state authorized legal status. It communicates to the excluded, the undocumented, criminalized, convicted, or outcasts, that legal status means nothing. The only thing that matters is that you are here with us. But it takes a lot of work to, get, to make this understanding as pervasive as the forces driving bans, walls, and raids. The solidarity that drives sanctuary organizing is about defending each other, but it is also about protecting the grounds of our relations to each other, of the ability to defend each other in the first place. As Mi Gente, a radical Latinx organization, declares, the only community of sanctuary is an organized one. Thank you. So Javiela will ask a few questions. Yes. Thank you for that beautiful talk. Um, I've been excited to be on this panel with you um, and had other questions in mind, but um, given your conversation on sanctuary, um, 
just thinking through, so it seems like it involves a relationship with the state to some degree, um, necessarily so. And so one of the goals is to make that relationship with the state as useful as possible. I wanna clarify. So it seems like there is a relationship with the state that can be used or something that can be taken from that. Um, but then alongside that, there's this reciprocal relationship that's based in kinship. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, towards the end of your talk when you mentioned that in the end legal status means nothing, that it's more about this uh, reciprocal relationship and kinship. I'm inspired by that and thinking about the possibilities of that, but then also wondering, you know, kind of based on uh, the conversation that I had as well, um, what does it mean when legal status means nothing? Um, if it's something that people are also working to attain. Mm -hmm. It seems like, you know, yeah. two realities can work side by side, because um, I struggle with that advocating for citizenship rights. Um, the limitations of those rights, as I mentioned, you get them and then what? What about people who don't have them? What are we saying um, in particular about the migrants, uh, people who are migrants who are the parents of Dominicans of Haitian descent? So just struggling with all of that because what you proposed is, um, or what's being proposed here and, and happening is exciting, um, but I'm just wondering about those complications. So the, the state um, and you know, also when we've advocated um, in Albany to pass a resolution, a toothless, toothless resolution against statelessness in the DR, um, some uh, activist friends came back and said, you know, shame on you for going to the U.S. government uh, for help and for kind of permission and for assistance when they are the ones who are militarizing the border right now. So all of these complexities, but I hope there's a question in there that yeah. you can answer. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for that awesome question. Um, yeah, so I, I am constantly like on the one hand and then on the other hand, because on the one hand we have to deal with the world that is, right. right? And on the other hand, I'm always thinking about the world that I want, yeah. right? And I think that the world that we want always has to be like our kind of North Star when we're thinking about what is happening right now. Right, so um, the relationship, so um, sanctuary movement or like lots of different kinds of uh, social movements are um, looking to the state to do stuff. And often it's like to stop doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Stop putting, registering our children's names in a gang database without telling us just, for, just because they're hanging out. Right. You know, stop uh, policing us. Stop investing into um, you know police and borders and things like this, and start reinvesting in schools and health and community gardens and, and yeah, exactly. So um, in order to ask this, like to get the state to stop doing things, that means you have to make a claim on the state, right? right? So you have to be speaking to the state on some level. Mm -hmm. At the same time, this is where I, this is where my question was kind of coming from. The state has never been here. For, for many of these people, like ever, right? Um, foundational liberal political philosophy has also never been there for these kinds of people. So then what do you do? <laughs> like going to the state for redress or for recognition is always gonna like trap you in a certain kind of way. But at the same time, you kind of have to get the state to stop killing you, right? So, um, so at the same time that um, I think these movements are looking to the state to either do, do stuff or stop doing stuff. They are also kind of working autonomously. And I'm wondering like what kind of possibilities can open up if we don't focus all of our energies on getting the state to stop doing stuff or to start doing stuff, right? And what do we do when we start building stuff on our own, right? And so I think that um, on the one hand, legal status mean, means no, like I don't care what someone's legal status is if they're in front of me, right? Or if they're in my community or in my life. Your legal status, doesn't that doesn't determine my relationship to you. That's what I mean about it. But that does not mean that legal status means nothing to someone who does not have legal status. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So like on the one hand, I'm trying to get to the place, like the world that I want is a world where citizenship doesn't really exist anymore because we don't need it. Right? Or I want to get to the place where we don't need rights anymore to secure certain kinds of um, livable life, means towards a livable life, right? But we are really, really far from both of those things. So right now, 
like I like I think people need rights recognition right now, and so it's like um, how so I think it's. I'm always like kind of battling towards, you know, like trying to think about the right now, but then also thinking about the political horizon. So I think that's where this kind of like, are you really saying legal status means nothing? To me it does, but to, I know to the state, which will inflict violence against us, it means a lot, right? Yeah. Thank, thank you for framing that around what is now, the reality uh, realities of now um, in conversation with visions moving forward. And I think, um, you know, just yesterday I was in a departmental meeting teaching, but we're planning a course on Afrofuturism, which isn't new, but at City Tech, um, new. And so this notion of thinking about how we conceptualize and build and uh, frame moving forward alongside dealing with the realities of the moment. Um, I think it's really important, but it's something that I struggle with too, because legal uh, status uh, is important for people who don't have it, and even for those of us who have it, um, it's critical. Yeah. But even as you were, sorry, yeah. <laughs> even as you were saying, um, you know, like even if uh, Haitian deportees or uh, denationalized Haitians in the Dominican Republic, like tomorrow everything just changed and they were recognized as citizens. Yeah. That does not actually change the whole foundation of exactly. where that denationalization came from. Right. And so we have to kind of think on both levels at the same time. Right. You know, so having said that, it's like when the state does stuff, society also it can embolden those kind of, uh, those uh, nasty roots, right? right? Um, and so it's not for what the state does. I just don't want the state to be the only thing. Right. Right. Completely agree, and I won't keep the mic. Um, but thinking about, um, you know, simultaneous simultaneous projects that um, can happen, and um, just to speak again on uh, the work in the DR, there's a um, activity or a movement right now to uh, make black dolls, and for uh, denationalize women to make black dolls and to sell them as a way to try to build further self-reliance um, when unable to work while denationalized, but also amplifying the beauty of blackness and educating young children, you know, all of these things. And it seems like a simple intervention. Um, some of the critiques received are, you know, dolls, why is this a big deal? Um, but I think it speaks to kind of the dual, multiple work that needs to happen. So thank you. Thank you all. So I would like to ask a few questions before we open, if it's okay. Um, some of them are more specific, some of them are more general. Uh, so it could be uh, for uh, everyone to, to discuss. Uh, well, first, um, Javiela, uh, when we were, you were describing the situation in the Dominican Republic, I was also thinking about the border of Brazil and Paraguay, which is very similar. Uh, we have the so-called uh, Braziguayos, that people mm -hmm. don't have any citizenship. They're not Brazilians and they're not uh, Paraguayans. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very much related to um, also the agribusiness uh, and land grabbing that mm -hmm. happens around there. Most of the landowners in Paraguay are Brazilians. And Paraguay and, Bra and Brazil, both countries have the most unequal uh, distribution of land in the world is mm. very much concentrated. So, um, and uh, at the same time, uh, we know that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, many of the Haitian uh, immigrants are working the sugar plantations right. in the border, right? So the role of agribusiness, and because that is a, a function in terms of, the, you know, the, the labor right. uh, surplus that, uh, this uh, uh, generates, um, and that uh, also relates uh, with uh, what uh, Sharon was uh, talking about um, uh, in terms of um, how uh, labor uh, or migrant labor is also used internally, for example, here in the United States to keep wages low. Uh, for example, uh, there was a very large program, the Braceros program in California, to bring workers, farm workers from Mexico 
uh, between the 60s and the 90s, uh, it's estimated that about 400,000 workers came from Mexico to work in the plantations in, in California. And um, one of the functions of the program was uh, actually to keep wages low. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is you know, the, the, the internal function as well as the external function of uh, you know, using the so-called uh, the surplus labor and uh, connected to the, the issue of uh, uh, papers and um, uh, immigration laws. Uh, also, um, we also uh, have the same, the, the issue of uh, internal displacement uh, in the case of uh, Palestine and Colombia, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when we talk about migration and we talk about borders, um, the whole history of borders is a history of violence, right? Mm -hmm. As a geographer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, if you see a map, it's, it's, it's about violence. Borders are all about violence. So um, how do we break that notion? That also has a relationship with, you know, the notion of state, the nation state versus this idea of globalization that, you know, it's now kind of a fancy word, but it's uh, what is different now in relation to, uh, you know, what moder modernity is about and the role of the, of the nation state. Because uh, I think maybe the, the difference is uh, uh, the mechanisms that allow capital to move more freely around the world, right, to free trade agreements and financial markets. Uh, so, for example, in terms of the, of the farm workers in the sugarcane plantations, uh, what the U.S. government was doing, for example, uh, to, uh, to import ethanol at that time uh, made from sugarcane was to use the trade agreements with the Caribbean and Central American countries in the production in those countries uh, because uh, at that time the free trade area of the Americas uh, was was not approved. So how you know those uh, uh, financial policies and uh, the flow of financial capital also have to do with that. So it's not a crisis. It's it's part of the yeah. of the process, right? What uh, Naomi was was talking about, and. Uh, so also at the same time, when we talk about resistance and internationalism, um, we, uh, we had, within the World Social Forum, we had the, the, the World uh, Forum of uh, a Migrant, of a Migration. And uh, the last one I participated was in Spain, very large, about 20,000 people. And uh, you know the slogan was "No person is illegal." So it was you know it really uh, challenged this uh, this idea of uh, citizenship. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was also a proposal to, to create a global passport, so you know to challenge the the idea of borders as well. Uh, so uh, when so how do we? on one hand, look at uh, labor migration and capital migration, and at the same time, look at uh, how, um, you know, U.S. imperialism and uh, this process of uh, neocolonialism or so-called globalization uh, is about control. Free market is not about freedom. It's about controlling markets, large corporation controlling, having very strict control over international markets, uh, the same way that uh, what causes displacement is control over uh, labor, land, natural resources, and the processes of um, uh, generating all kinds of uh, uh, interventions in war, many times uh, called humanitarian interventions, right? As in the case of, the, of Haiti, for example, that um, the Brazilian uh, troops were part of. So anyway, just putting some ideas out there if you would like to comment, thanks. Sure, um, 
I'm thinking about uh, the architect of the law in the DR under uh, President Fernandez at the time. Um, he also created the first subway system in the Dominican Republic, just making a link between modernity as I move along. Um, the first uh, subway system there, and his campaign was called um, Subete al Progreso, to get his um, you know, support. So his whole kind of the architecture of denationalization was a project of modernization in Dominican Republic, um, an anti-black project. And so when I'm thinking about um, economic changes in the Dominican Republic as the country uh, aims to diversify its economy and uh, you know, increasingly has a stronger uh, tourism, a uh, trade tourism industry, um, the ways in which um, the peripheral migrants who used to come to the Bates to, um, to, to work in the sugarcane industry, how the context is changing. And so, you know, now that the tourism industry is of more importance in the Dominican Republic, what are the ways in which the labor that had previously been um, relied upon so significantly is being dispossessed and the law seems to be one clear way in which it's happening. And we know that with deportations and with the dispossession of people, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be less workers to do uh, the work. It just changes the, the rights of those who are uh, the, the laborers there. So I'm thinking about um, you know, the, the changes, the ways in which the tourism industry, which we know is um, highly uh, dependent and um, you know, controlled by outside factors, is also playing a part in what's happening in the Dominican Republic and the dispossession of Dominicans of Haitian descent and how that's all framed within a context of modernity and advancement. Um, Altagracia, Jean Joseph, an activist who I spoke to said, you know, this is what uh, modernization means for the Dominican state. We can see, you know, what advancement means. And it's exactly the project of those who built the nation um, being excluded from it formally. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, borders are. Um, <clears throat> Violence, yes. Uh, this is, um, but not only borders between countries. This is why uh, I, I said bordering practices instead of borders. And bordering practices involves more actors than states, yeah? Um, and in, in relation to what you said about keeping wages low using migrants, uh, I was thinking about first of May 2015, for the first time after the revolution, Iranian workers got a chance to have a manifestation on Workers' Day. Uh, they came with uh, slogans and placards against Afghan migrant workers, yeah? Deport them, deport foreigners, yeah? So this is how states, you know, use partitions, bordering, uh, separation of workers to, to manipulate. Uh, as um, Gunther Anders, it was um, Hannah Arendt's first husband, I guess, as he said, if you want to have a loyal slave, give her or him an under slave. So this is, uh, you know, how, how the states manipulate, uh, manipulate uh, workers. And I, I, I was also thinking about um, citizenship that is not anymore, you know, we, in, when we think about migration, departure, arrival, citizenship, it's, you know, lin linear process, which is not anymore there. You know, citizenship is turned into quasi-citizenship, in conditional citizenship, and it's a struggle, every day a struggle for for rights and and we see more and more how citizenship is taken away from migrants. For example, in Norway, uh, I have some example. Also in Canada, not I'm not talking about people who are accused for terrorism. I'm talking about not you know people are not involved in terrorism at all, but citizenship based on different reasons taken away from them and they are deported after 17 years, one case, 27 years, 
another case, Norway. And also in Iran, during a mass deportation of Afghans, more than 300 Iranian nationals, poor, addicted, drug addicted, who had no papers, they were also deported. So what citizenship means um, in, you know, anymore? Um, yeah, so, so that violent bordering practices happens not along the borders between states, but every day, anywhere. It can happen. Somebody's, yeah. Not, not everybody's, yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I completely agree that bordering, it, it's a bordering practice and not just national, the borders between nation states, but there's also a relationship between national, those state borders between nation states and those internal interior borders. And so the hyping up of, um, uh, the borderization at national edges also is affecting what's going on internal to those spaces. So there's a relationship between them and I'm interested in thinking through those more. Um, what are those relationships between like the edges and the interior, especially as the interior looks more and more like the edge, right? Like in the United States, um, uh, border practices um, were at first you know, kind of confined to certain jurisdictions that were kind of close to the border and now under the Trump regimes, some of those practices of like expedited removal and like the abrogation of um, Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights is now covers the entire nation, but only for certain kinds of subjects who are suspected of being an undocumented person, right? So now like all of the nations, all of the interior of the United States is considered border space for certain kinds of people. So I'm interested in those kinds of things as well. But I'm also interested if there are um, these like, uh, as the state tries to hype up these uh, borderized, bordering practices between the included and the excluded at national edges and how that's affecting people on the, in, on the inside or whatever, <laughs> or like these kind of internal borderization practices, then what kind of um, possibilities are there for making those connections between, you know, the citizen who is a depor uh, deportable citizen, right, and the deportable non-citizen, or the person who is cast out by not only the state, but by, you know, labor markets, by um, uh, hegemonic society or whatever, right? So, um, you know, and thinking about uh, um, Maria Luisa's questions about um, thinking about the free mobility of capital and how that displaces not only people from over there who end up coming here as labor migrants, but it displaces people here as well, but they are not able to follow capital. Right, and so they're just, I mean, this is Ruthie's word, but they're displaced in place, right? And so what kinds of lines of solidarity can we find between those who are displaced in place and those who are displaced and forced to move to this new place, right? And so, um, you know, like, again, I'm borrowing from Ruthie's words, but um, like what kinds of lines can we find between people who are documented not to work through their criminalization and their um, contact with the criminal justice system um, and, you know, um, not being, uh, you know, kind of being expelled from labor markets that way. And then people who are undocumented, right, um, who don't have the documents, but uh, whose undocumented status makes them hyper exploitable in those same labor markets. There are lines of solidarity that we can find, but we have to have the kind of analysis that allows us to see those lines. Thank you so much. So uh, we can open now. I would like to ask uh, everyone to be brief, please, um, in your questions. So 30 seconds, please, okay? No more than 30 seconds. Okay. You're going to keep count, I know. Yes, uh, I will. Well, that's amazing, okay. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, okay, uh, the issue of the surplus labor. Marx, uh, you know, I hope, they told the English working class that they should fight for Irish independence because Irish labor was taking the jobs for, uh, from uh, English uh, laborers. And that, you can then say, uh, was uh, also a part of the uh, resistance against the Haitians coming in and, uh, and other people coming in in Europe. Um, although in Europe, maybe it's a different issue in terms of a, a cultural issue, like in Uppsala and in, in Malmo, et cetera. Now, as far as Naomi, I think I have 15 seconds. Naomi, um, to be charitable, 
Yes, uh, in the, my neighborhood, okay, on my subway platform, an MS-13 gang member who was known to be an MS-13 gang member murdered another person right on my subway platform. I'd love to be charitable, love to be kind, uh, but uh, I would just say in five seconds that according to the statistics, US uh, DHS, an illegal immigrant with a prior criminal conviction was charged with murder every 12 days from 2010 to 2014. Yes, let's be nice, let's be generous, let's welcome people in, but if they're hurting our, us, the victims, the people that are here, they shouldn't be here in the first place. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we're gonna take uh, more questions, um, please. We're going to have a few round of questions. Okay. Thank, um, you. thank you all for really provocative um, uh, presentations today, really and rounds of talking with each other. I'm very interested in how all of you are thinking about the various ways in which the space of the planet's surface is being reconfigured. So you've talked about nation states, you've talked about free trade areas, you've talked about the long kind of discontinuous spaces where uh, long distance migrants, whether voluntary or not, uh, accumulate and then disperse. Um, Shahram talked about, uh, oh gosh, deportspora. I, that's a tongue, tongue twister. Um, so I wonder, I wonder if you would all just talk geographically for a moment, how, you, how you're seeing the sort of spatial categories of the planet today. Thank you. A few more questions, please. Yeah, just to add to that, um, uh, I really enjoyed the presentations too and, and the subsequent conversation. Um, another issue in the mobilization, right, is, is trying to find a language that is not immediately colonized by those who you would oppose, right? So I remember when I was doing work back in the day on Foxconn uh, in Shenzhen um, in, in southern China, um, one of the pitches that, they, that uh, Foxconn was making was that uh, this was a special economic zone and that it was a tax sanctuary, right? So they're using the terminology of sanctuary uh, you know, to, to kind of make excuses for why corporations could make a lot of money. And obviously, you know, Apple heard that sound and, um, and populated uh, the area in abundance. So um, I, it's not a question of policing the language, right, but of always being vigilant about the, this, this possibility that the, the language of opposition is, is constantly being uh, appropriated and reappropriated for other means, and I think that works. That works a lot within the rubric of uh, people who migrate, um, getting redefined in a positive way, and then that language being turned against them when a policy is subsequently made um, to uh, ex expel. Thank you. Um, one more question. I, I just wondered if you had any comments on the sort of uh, organizational power that might reside within diasporas. I think this is, uh, uh, hasn't really been discussed very much. So they, so, so, sorry, I think we, uh, we had the problem with the microphone. Uh, about uh, the, the diaspora forms of uh, uh, migrants, uh, you know, Haitian migrants here and The organization of power that lies in the diaspora? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, we missed that important <laughs> word. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks, David. Okay, who would like to go first? <laughs> okay, so um, first about the language. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and, you know, uh, I've, I've thought about this, and, you know, sanctuary itself is a neutral term. It can be used for positive or negative means. So a sanctuary, there can be right-wing sanctuaries where, like, people are, you know, you know, 
group getting themselves together. You know what I mean? And that can be a right wing sanctuary or, um, you know, um, thinking about FTZs as tax sanctuaries. You know, the sanctuary for is the important question, <laughs> right? So it can be a sanctuary for things we don't want, right? As much as it can be a sanctuary for people in duress that we want to keep with us, right? And so sanctuary itself in that sense is kind of a neutral term. However, I do think that if we think to its kind of genealogical underpinnings, it, it is grounded in this kind of religion. I mean, and there's like many problems with <laughs> all of the religions that um, have notions of sanctuary at their roots, but there are kind of moral and phys philosophical um, kind of claims that the term is making. But the way it can be deployed is not necessarily going to be for things that we like, and it's not necessarily going to be practiced in ways that we think are um, conducive to what the getting to the world that we want. So I completely agree with you. Um, I think that I'm less interested, like while I'm keeping holding on to the word, I'm less interested in the word than the work. So um, for example, Freedom to Thrive is uh, using the term freedom city rather than sanctuary city. And part of that is a clap back to this kind of liberal version of sanctuary cities, which continues to cast out the criminal alien while protecting the law abiding, undocumented, family oriented, hardworking person. Right? And so I am completely on board with both the critique and with their platform. Um, but at the same time, I think that freedom is also a very fraught word because it's one of the key words of the neoliberal cultural project. That we are free, f we should be free from s the state regulation, that corporations should be free from state um, intervention, et cetera, et cetera. You should be free to be your best entrepreneurial self, et cetera, et cetera. So I think all of these words kind of have some kind of weightedness to them and can be deployed in very many ways, but I take your point very much. Um, about this MS-13 gang member, okay. So I have so many things to say about this. <laughs> um, so my book is coming out next summer, so you should read it. Um, but okay, so on the one hand, <laughs> you can like bring up all of these statistics that say, you know, um, <laughs> locations with higher immigrant populations have lower crime rates, that immigrants are generally less likely to commit crimes than uh, citizens. Et cetera, et cetera, that you know, immigrant uh, our uh, neighborhoods tend to be safer, et cetera. But that is a, that is also a trap, right? Because you're you're again playing into this good law-abiding immigrant uh, discourse against the law-breaking um, criminal citizen or non-citizen. And so I don't want to play into that um, rhetoric. What I will say is that let's think about the structural roots of things like MS-13. Where did MS-13 come from? MS-13 is a US-based gang, right, that, was, um, that came together from asylees and refugees from Central America who were expelled by the dirty wars that the US was funding. Okay, so like, let's really think about, it. you have to have a transnational analysis about these forms of violence and where they come from. How did MS-13 then get back to the Northern Triangle states? It was through a deportation regime. So we just think that if we just expel people that that's it, that that violence goes away. And that is a very like simple-minded solution to a very deep endemic problem, okay? So like let's think about the structural roots of these things. Um, the other thing is, is like if you wanna get real about um, ending violence, then having the state increase violence has historically shown to only escalate the problem and to not actually solve the problem. What it does is that it further casts out certain kinds of bodies and certain kinds of people, right? But it doesn't actually resolve forms of violence. So if you want to look at different kinds of models, then look at like the uh, Peace Zones for Life in Detroit, right? Where um, rather than calling police, you train people who are in communities directly affected by things like gang violence and things like this, and you set up different kinds of um, education for peer mediation so that people don't call the police, but then they also don't resort to harming each other in terms of um, resolving interpersonal violence. And that has been shown to de-escalate violence and actually solve the problem. So um, that's what I would say about that. But I think um, <laughs> there's many other things to say about uh, the category of the criminal alien and the criminalization of immigrants overall being hitched to the figure of someone like an MS, like the, scare, the really bad, scary person, right? And that being deployed to, to criminalize like entire populations of millions of people. So, I mean, I, that's what I would say about that, but I would also like to think, 
I don't want this conversation to get sucked into this black hole either, because I think that there were other really productive questions to think about. So I'd like to kind of, and I, I feel like I've responded, and I'm like, I'd like to move on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, just to, to respond um, to Ruthie's question about uh, the space of the planet, um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, the Dominican Republic, of course, but uh, Flint, Michigan, and, you know, the ways in which uh, privatization and, you know, neoliberal policies can impact people's lives directly. Thinking about um, the hurricanes in the Caribbean and the impact that they've had uh, there, um, and the ways in which, again, corporate entities often tied to the United States try to take advantage. So, just when you, uh, you know, asked about the ways in which geographically these spaces um, are involved in that conversation, those examples came to mind. In terms of the organization uh, of the diaspora, the power of the diaspora, I think it mirrors some of the complications we've talked about today. Um, as a group that's organized here in the United States, we often talk about what it means to organize from the United States, um, the role of U.S. imperialism historically in facilitating some of the problems that we're talking about, um, while at the same time trying to use positionality that may come from um, being in the United States, whether a faculty member or a student or a part of a community group in Washington Heights. So um, I think there's a lot of power in the diaspora, but the need for a lot of conversation, too, um, about inequities um, within the diaspora. Along those same lines, it seems like it's important to make connections about the erosion of civil liberties um, that connect the diaspora. So I was just reading this morning great news about um, how in Ohio, um, six weeks into um, a pregnancy, um, that a woman can no longer have an abortion. And so, you know, abortion is not legalized in the Dominican Republic either. And so just thinking about these connections, um, I think are important in terms of the diaspora um, and also kind of these borders that you're talking about, um, the erosion of civil liberties all around. Yes, of course, geography is important and um, many, <clears throat> many parts of bordering practices um, 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 happens thanks to geography. Um, I mean, you know, forests, rivers, mountains, you know, when the states cannot, you know, relocate, you know, border controls to make border crossings difficult thanks to natural um, um, hinders. Uh, and also, you know, you know, islands, for example, Manus Island, we have Lesbos have been turned into prisons. And it's important to call it prison and not detention camps or reception camps or refugee camps, but they are prisons, yeah? So it's important to keep calling them as what they are, prisons. Um, <clears throat> and I remember, um, and geography and how uh, uh, senses, you know, if you don't sense a border, it is not a border. So it's important to sense it, to, you know, feel it with your body. And I remember a few months ago, the Danish migration minister, she said, uh, she decided to send asylum seekers to an isolated island in Denmark. And she said this way, I quit her. They are undesired and they have to feel it. So we send them to an island and they have to feel it, you know, with their bodies you have. To. So, so geography, is, of course, is, is important. And in terms of diaspora, I was thinking about um, a research I do among Afghans who are deported from different countries to Afghanistan. And to Afghanistan, a country they have never been to. Yeah, they grow up born in other countries and now they are deported to a country they've never been to. And in that small community, when they find each other, a question they ask each other is, where are you deported from? And opposite to where are you from, you know, where are you 
from and where are you deported from, where are you deported from uh, creates a kind of uh, sentiments, a community of sentiments, uh, uh, not uh, belonging to a territory or national identity, but to a condition, yeah? Uh, and I think diaspora is, is there, you know, get that kind of engagement, uh, the Portspra or, or diaspora uh, organization, how they get together and, and try to find uh, a way to survive. Yeah, so of course, yes, please. Thank you so much. So we're gonna have another round of uh, questions. I just wanted to make one comment uh, in relation to Ruthie's um, uh, question about the geography. Uh, and also to go back to comparing uh, you know, human migration, people's migration, and uh, uh, capital migration. Um, when I look at uh, financial capital and land grabbing, for example, which is the, the topic of my research, um, and uh, the relationship between uh, migration of capital and time and space, uh, it's actually, uh, leads me to think of uh, space as an abstraction, as opposed to the f very physical space that people deal with, with when they migrate, right? Um, so, uh, and then in relation to time, uh, the same thing, in, instead of, so in, 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 in relation to the migration of capital, uh, space becomes an abstraction and time becomes a simultaneous concept as opposed to a progressive concept. For example, uh, in relation to future markets. Uh, future markets are uh, a promise of production in the future. So in a way, you know, it's not the circulation of capital now, it's the circulation of cap, it's a promise of circulation of capital in the future. So time becomes a simultaneous process and space becomes an abstraction as opposed, you know, to the concept of uh, uh, space as a physical space and time as a progressive uh, concept. So, can we have a few more comments? Please, questions. Hi, um, wonderful comments. I, I wanted to ask a question in relation to the last thing that Maria Luisa just said about space-time. Um, you know, David Harvey has written about space-time contraction as a way of understanding globalization and neoliberalism. Cindy Katz, who's here, has talked about space-time expansion for people who are displaced and into forced migration. I'm wondering how um, space-time is felt as either contracting, expanding, or both for the communities that you're researching. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful panel. I also want to thank um, all the invisible labor that made this happen. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, a little louder. So my question is um, about image and photography. Um, I'm, my question is, if you want to share um, anything about imagery, the circulation of imagery, and as it relates to your um, bodies of research and, and work, I'm uh, inspired to ask this question. Um, it's also my field. I actually teach photojournalists, and I'm um, glad, um, Maria Luisa, that you mentioned um, that you mentioned the Bracero program because I show my students uh, images from that program and they have such a hard time believing um, because, uh, and I use those pictures, I use those pictures specifically to show that the wall we're talking about now is absolutely a continuation of existing practices and labor dependencies just like the Immigration Act and Chinese Exclusion Act, all these things are sort of continuations of things. So because I'm arriving at this from a perspective of image and visual cases, I'd love to hear from you how image plays into your research or, or, or um, how images and specifically photographs have helped or not helped the uh, work that you do. Everyone more? 
Hi. Uh, thank you so much for all the provocative ideas and the conversation. So um, speaking, um, my question is also related to the space time. Um, I work on uh, demilitarized uh, geographic areas or zones and like the questions around sanctuary um, and also like spaces of resistance really kind of makes me think about um, this, you know, thinking about spatialities and temporalities and thinking about um, particularly when I, you know, when I look at spaces of sanctuary, for example, or demilitarized zones or like protests in the tracks, train tracks, I see them as, um, you know, like us, uh, Keller Easterling would describe it as extra state craft, right? Like uh, extraterritorial, extra state practices of resistance, right? Um, but when I study those kind of um, practices and spaces, I always find that the practices of people who are resisting um, impositions of violence by the state require a set, a require a level of interdependence, right? Interdependence with the state. Um, so I was. I'm curious to hear kind of like what's the radical horizon of those kind of interdependent practices, right? Of those resisting um, state violence, right? And then the second question in time, um, what I also find out um, in some of these cases uh, is the, you know, kind of like practices of refusal, right? And we've talked about, um, say, like how um, resistance. Um, say like resistance and deportation, et cetera, can be framed as, uh, as, as a response to global capitalism and, and labor extraction and accumulation. And I wonder if, um, like what's, okay, again, like thinking about uh, resistance to deportation as a refusal of time, right? Capitalist time and accumulation time. Um, like what's the radical kind of, kind of, you know, open, like what kind of radical openings can it provide us in better understanding, um, say like, how we think of migration spatially, but also temporally, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, <clears throat> images. Um, um, I, I find it very difficult. I never use PowerPoints uh, or images uh, of in the case of migration because it, it's it's f for me it's very difficult. We have a long, long history of how images have been used to deface migrants and to dename migrants uh, or or uh, uh, other other groups. Um, um, so I, 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 I don't use and I don't know how to use uh, and I'm very critical to many, many uh, ways people use images uh, um, when, when, when it comes to, to bordering practices and, and migrants. Um, so not so much of help to you for you <laughs> or your students. Uh, but <coughs> Um, but of course, it's part of the, the question and problem. Uh, when it comes to time and, and space, I was thinking, um, um, I was thinking, um, uh, uh, I was in a detention center uh, a few years ago, and what, uh, many times, and what was new that time for me was clocks on the, the, the main hall and the showing different time zones, showing times of countries, continents, people were supposed to deport to. And it was kind of indication of these people don't belong to, not only to this place, but to this time. So, um, and as you know, it, 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 the core of colonial racism has been denial of co-evilness, that people, the other belongs to a different time, yeah? Um, and this is exactly what happens in, in that, you know, for me it was, you know, um, th yeah, that, that kind of, these people don't belong to this time, therefore they should be deported, yeah? They don't belong to this time, to our time, to our national time, Therefore, they should be deported from this territory. Um, so 
there is this time space uh, interplay there, uh, which is of course very important, uh, and how a white time is is constructed, uh, a white time which is uh, supposed to be progressive, modern, secular, neutral, uh, and the other doesn't belong to this because he or she is supposed to be religious or traditional or I don't know, yeah? So, so this is very interesting, this white time, racialized time, and, um, and how the other arrived always too late, as Fanon put it, yeah? We always arrived too late to the white world because the white world is already shaped formed uh, and resources are already allocated uh, to, to bodies and we always arrive too late, yeah? Uh, we cannot change it, yeah? We are not subjects, we are objects, yeah? So, so I think it's important point you, you ask if this, yeah, this was a reflection. Um, in terms of space and time, my first thought was about uh, social media as a way of speeding up time um, and space and, you know, kind of its use within um, diasporas and um, communication tools like WhatsApp and things of that nature and the ways in which um, obviously they can be useful but also complicate um, the activities of movements and um, things of that nature. But I'm also thinking about paperwork um, in terms of the, the struggle for Dominicans of Haitian descent um, towards citizenship and the conversation about uh, time um, and just the bureaucracy of these processes when I was there kind of witnessing um, people going from different centers to different centers without answers. Um, just a lot of you know, time being used. Yeah. Um, in terms of photographs, um, I think about this too a lot uh, with the work and um, I think oftentimes if photographs come from uh, people who are directly impacted or involved um, um, in the work that they're doing, um, there's an old project, Photo Voice, where people uh, you know, could use different uh, cameras and take a documentation and that seems to me to be possibly a different kind of project um, where documentation is happening by people who are impacted and they have some control over the images but then where they go and whose PowerPoint they end up on and you know is a whole other conversation. Recently you all probably heard in the news about Renty's image, an enslaved man um, that where his image is in possession of Harvard uh, University and his family is, you know, commenting. So it's a wrought conversation, but I think there's a certain responsibility that we need to pay attention to that I appreciated in, in the conversation. Um, I'm interested in this question about uh, practices of refusal um, and thinking about uh, as a mode of res resistance to deportation. Um, and I think that, you know, like the thing that I'm talking about with um, this example, this kind of like, uh, it's an example of more of popular sovereignty or something like that, where we're, we are creating <laughs> the power among ourselves. And that is a, a, it is a practice of refusing to have the state dictate to me how I relate to people around me and how I relate to anyone who's here or who's like elsewhere, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's like, a, but a practice of refusal also has to recognize what it, what specifically it is refusing, right? And so it's still an engagement, even if it's a refusal of like, this is what I'm not, this is how I'm not rolling with you. And this is how I'm doing something different. And so you still have to understand like what it is that's being refused. And so it, it requires a kind of like specific and uh, analysis, right? Um, so that's what I would say about that. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of images and photography, I think it really depends <laughs> on how, what is, who's taking the image 
of what and how it's circulated. But even once the image is taken, it especially with photographs, um, it always catches more than like the photographer maybe is intending. And it can also be read like against its intention. And so I think, you know, the problem of photography and the way that it can be used to dehumanize, especially migrants, I feel like, especially migrants in like camps, you know, um, or, you know, uh, you know, especially if they're racialized certain ways. I think even the, the problem, the solution to that problem is not to withdraw photographs altogether. It's more of having a persistent reading of the photograph. Right, and to like, if it's just circulated like in news media without any kind of criticism or critique um, or with the wrong kinds of captions as we saw in like Hurricane Katrina or something like that, then it is on us to do a kind of rigorous reading and critique of those images and how they're deployed. Yeah, I want to say something <coughs> briefly about this practice of refusal, I forgot. Um, <coughs> let, let me see, I mean, um, make a self-promotion. Um, my, my book, Illegal Travelers, is about refusal, practice of refusal. And, and, you know, practice of refusal in forms of rejecting, avoiding, um, to respond to a state as the state expects you to respond. And I imagine I traveled all the way from Iran to India, from India to Sweden, in, with different passports, with different names. Uh, I traveled from India to, to Sweden with a Greek passport and my name was Kostas. Um, this is a refusal. This is, I refuse to respond to the states as I was expected by the states to, to respond. So, so, and many other people who travel without papers or forge paper uh, every day is uh, they, they practice this kind of you know refusal and it's it's uh, it's very important because what they do uh, show us that what is forged I mean what you know there is no authenticity in any kind of nation, national belonging, citizenship. If I can cross borders, many borders as Kostas with the Greek passport, it shows that uh, even, even, even if passport issued by Swedish um, authorities for me, it's also something, it's also forged, you know, forging its double meaning, yeah, it's constructed, yeah. Um, so I think it's, um, I mean, that kind of forgery it's, uh, or practice of refusal uh, sh show us uh, that, that nation states is also a forged form, you know, uh, of, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes, so I think we have uh, time for another quick round of questions. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things. One is this uh, idea of... Uh, legality and interpretation of what is legal, right? Uh, for example, we know that uh, there are several clandestine detention centers for immigrants in Europe. Uh, for example, when we were at the migrant forum in Spain, uh, after the forum, we had the demonstrations on the streets and also um, European citizens uh, demanding uh, access to these uh, illegal clandestine detention centers. Uh, so, you know, how the state uses also illegal methods to so-called enforce, supposedly to enforce the law, right? So uh, questioning this whole idea of legality of, and interpretation of that. And then uh, the idea that uh, uh, some people are just too late you know, what does that mean? I think it's also related to the concept of development and the interpretation of what that means uh, in relation to the idea of time as this progressive uh, thing that uh, leads us to a certain model of uh, capitalism that supposedly, you know, is the ideal model of development instead of thinking that uh, um, the 
the colonies are also as modern as the, the colonizers because uh, without the, the colonies, there wouldn't be any type of uh, development of the capitalist state, right? So in the case of Brazil, for example, there is this uh, concept that uh, Brazil was created as a na not as a nation state, but as a corporate state with the function of exporting labor, commodities, raw material, and so forth. So, um, so the idea that uh, you know somehow countries are in this line, you know, this uh, uh, moving towards a certain ideal uh, place, and this supposedly is development, and how that uh, is related to. Um, criminalizing the movement of people uh, in labor, um, I think that also relates with the idea of time and time and space. So, um, do, can we have a, a few more questions? No? <laughs> okay, so we are finishing 10 minutes uh, earlier, so we have more time to have informal conversations. Thank you so much. <laughs>